What will be most important to Washington down the stretch? You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He's site editor with Athon Sports is inside the Huskies. I'm the site editor with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen today as we are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Lars has got a really fun show coming out all the everyday day. We're going to get into a little bit of recruiting because 247 Sports updated their top 247 on Wednesday, and there are five Huskies in that uh, in those rankings, which is really nice to see. It's a real testament to Jed and this recruiting class, which still ranks number 18 in the country. We're going to talk about Denzel Boston, who was named to the Bulletnikoff Award watch list early on Wednesday morning. And the first thing we're going to do, though, is also one quick reminder before we get into that to all the everydayers out there, everybody listening, that submit your questions on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, wherever you follow us down in the comments below for our Friday mailbag. We're going to have a lot of fun with that. We've already gotten some awesome questions. It's going to be a great time. But Lars, you know, to segue that uh, horribly into today's show, because I'm sure these these are things people are going to have questions about, is... What will be Washington's biggest X factor down the stretch? Now, we made this really broad. There are a whole lot of ways you could take this. It could be a player. It could be a position group. It could be a coach. It could be red zone offense. Whatever it might be, what is that biggest X factor for you? So I think, actually, perfect segue into that because I'm going to start with the offensive line. And yeah. it's, it's the X factor that kind of is basically the entire season. Like X marks the spot, and also it's the X factor. Like, hey, this is going to be the thing that ends up kind of being that difference maker, so to speak. That's kind of how I'm inferring the X factor. Because there's, when you say X factor, it's like, hey, is he the, the one matchup, or is this the one position group that's going to be key? It's like, well, first of all, if the offense plans on doing anything with any other element of this, red zone scoring, whatever you want to say, it has to start with the offensive line. And for me – that kind of boils down to Landon Hatchett and Max McCree. If Max okay. McCree is able to come back, because what, what it sounds like, and it was good news, bad news from Jed, where McCree was going to go see a hand specialist on Monday. We obviously haven't talked with Jed, you know, is what it is in terms of that. But he did say no surgery. So it's basically like, hey, is this going to be a one to two week sprain? You know, because again, it's a dislocated thumb. But is it going to be a one to two week thing like they thought Quentin Moore was originally going to, was going to be, or is it going to be like, hey, like we might need to actually like, you know, parlay this into like a season ending thing, which I don't think is going to be the case, or but m- missing significant amount of games because we've seen what that looks like without Max. Now again, Swan has also been hurt. Kaylee Tafai and both of him are, and Swan are redshirt freshmen, so you're really talking about that position and then left guard with guard and land and that kind of those two really being the key there. So there's one name you left out there and I know you didn't do it intentionally, but somebody that Jed talked about potentially getting some reps out there uh, moving forward. And I'm really curious to see when and where those might come. And that was Pocky Fina where I I'm just curious to see how that works out. That's something I wanted to throw in there because I like where you're going with that. For me, it comes down to the defensive line where Moving forward, we're going to see some different offenses where Indiana and Curtis work. They can throw the ball. Penn State with Drew Allen, they can throw the ball. Miller Moss and USC, they can throw the ball. Oregon and Dylan Gabriel, I'm not going to say it again. But it's going to come down to, we know the secondary is really solid. It's rock solid. I don't know if it's going to be able to, to sustain the number one in the country, 123 yards per game allowed level of play. But I think it is a really, really solid group, and I trust them in the back end. My question is, what is this front four going to look like? Because we know that Steve is going to be able to dial up some pressures and do some different things. But my question is, not only you know defending the run, but as pass rushers, can you win with four? Can you win consistently with four? And that's a question that I want to see answered against some of these tougher opponents, where it's weird to say that about Indiana, but you have to because they're a top 20 team in the country right now, where... I want to see if, you know, Zach Durfee getting healthy. We know that Jed said he's going to play after the bye week. Can he do that? Can Alinius Davis, can one of these defensive tackles get a push now that Javon Parker's out? Can Sebastian Valdez get healthy and continue to provide that push? Can Isaiah Ward, who's looked really good, Voight Tanufi, whoever it might be, 
Can any of those guys consistently get a push with four? I think they can. I think that they're going to surprise some people. And a lot of that is thanks to what Steve is also able to do to help them out and maximize their talent. But I, that's one thing I'm really, really curious about moving forward. So I, I like that point a lot. And, and the thing for me is not, it's basically all of that, but taking it a step further. Something we, we, when we've talked about, I guess that's, I've thought about this, where Washington hasn't forced a lot of turnovers this season. And then you think about the question that's kind of leading into it. Well, they placed a lot, they faced a lot of running first offenses. Now you're going into the meat of your passing first offense schedule with that pressure that you mentioned, whether it's four or five, however many guys they end up bringing, you're going to need to force some turnovers. You're going to need to create some possessions for this team, whether it's, you know, just on the defense or if by some miracle, the special teams can, you know, have a special teams touchdown that doesn't go against Washington. You know, you're just taking the bonus. That's a bonus at that point. But for me, it's really about the defense forcing some turnovers, especially against Penn State. Like you're going to need to create an extra possession against Penn State. At Indiana, you're probably going to need to create at least one or two extra possessions, just because again, when you're on the road, you know, we've seen what happens at home. You know, Michigan and and Washington. Well, not Washington State at home, but low key at home. Where when when they have had to not travel, they've been able to force some turnovers. But we haven't really seen that away from Husky Stadium. And sure. that to me is kind of the thing where, especially with a lot of these games, I mean, they only have two more games at home in the month of November. That's it. So a lot of this is going to have to come on the road. And that means creating some opportunities for yourself. And I think the pressure can create some turnovers and they got the guys to do it with EP and that and Elijah and Cam and Cam and all those guys on the back end. But the it's almost kind of like everything is just either, you know, if you, yeah, you can get a pun that's kind of a turnover. But you really almost need to create those short fields, similar to what Iowa's defense did against Washington, where you right. see the one play touchdown, where it's, hey, we get, we we didn't out gain Washington, yeah, we didn't have to, we had like three four play drives for touchdowns. That that's the whole point here. Absolutely. So, I I really like where you're going with that. I I also want to talk about a couple of players here, where I. I, I know who I want to I, I, I want to go with because we can you know parlay that in that next segment. Spoiler alert! But there's one other guy that I think we need to bring up here before we get there, and I know it's somebody that that you're a huge fan of because when I when I look at this team moving forward, I think that Alfonso Tupatala might be one of the biggest X, fact, X factors on this team. Yeah, I was gonna say I think the linebacker position. If there's gonna be a position on defense, I would say the linebackers. But I think Alfonso, and it's a little bit surprising because I thought we saw that Carson might be the green dot, but with the amount of things that Alfonso has been asked to do by Steve Belichick and the Stevens, and by the way, can do, I think that's yeah. why. And there's no slight to Carson. Carson's the traditional MLB linebacker, you know, the, 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 the throwback, if you will. But Zoe can do so many different things where it lines up in the slide, you know, lines up in the, you know, A gap, whatever you want to call it. There's so many different things that he's been able to do. So that keeping that is going to be an X factor for sure. No doubt about that, which is also leads into yours, which I know is going to be on the offensive side. Yep. I know. Spoiler alert. I'm going to spend 30 seconds on him now, and then we're going to continue this, this discussion on the other side of the break, but it's Denzel Boston, where you and I talked a lot about Denzel Boston throughout the spring, throughout the fall. Shout out to him. He's been spectacular. He leads the team. He's got 500 and with nine touchdowns, he's got 540 receiving yards, he's got 40 catches. He's been really, really good all season long, and he's going to need to sustain that play because he's going to see some good defensive back play moving forward too. And he's shown that he can get open against really good defensive backs. He did it against Michigan. He did it against Rutgers. He showed he can do it against Iowa too with Jamari Harris, where he's done it each and every week. He's been a consistent option. And he's one guy where, you know, Lars, we talked a lot about the red zone on yesterday's show. He's one person that he's mitigated a lot of red zone problems. He has nine touchdown catches. That's second in the nation. He's been fantastic. And that's one of many reasons he was named to the Bolitnikoff Award watch list on Wednesday which we'll get to right after the message from our good friends over at FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats for you live play-by-play and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. And with Thursday Night Football coming up shortly, I got a fun parlay that I, I also threw out the other day that I, I highly recommend where I haven't loved this Broncos defense against running backs. And big Alvin Kamara fan this week. I love his over on receptions and receiving yards. I love the anytime touchdown for him there. And I think if you go check out all those odds and so many more over on FanDuel for Thursday night's game, you could make yourself some money in the, this Saints-Broncos matchup, which might put you to sleep otherwise. 
So Lars, Denzel Boston, early on Wednesday morning, was first, literally the first thing I saw when I woke up, is Denzel Boston gets named to the Blitnikoff Award watch list. And I couldn't be happier for him. I think this is so awesome for so many different reasons. And I think the biggest one I wrote about a little bit over on Huskies Wire is the fact that last year he got to watch Roma Dunze do all this. And it's something you and I have said. We haven't, like, this isn't Roma Dunze's 2023 season, but we weren't necessarily expecting that from him. But we look at everything he's done and seeing who he's learned from the last two years, who he's had to sit behind, had to wait his turn, and now he's doing it and doing it so well. That's just so cool to see. Well, I mean, ironically, as you say that, I think if he has one touchdown catch the rest of the season in terms of per game the rest of the season, he would actually eclipse Rome's numbers last season. In terms that's of right, touchdown. he would, yeah. So that kind of speak. that's what's kind of kind of blown my mind as I look back through Denzel's stats. It's like we know he's been good. We knew he was going to be good, but to have the touchdowns, I think was a, the surprise, but then also B when you back it up into context, it's kind of been a half of Washington's offense. Like Jonah has been the other half and you know, Will and Denzel kind of come as a package zero because again, you, as a receiver, well, Giles has been that. awesome too. I can't, I can't, I can't take anything away from him. No, no he, but from a, from a touchdown perspective, like, Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 Because everything like if you take out Denzel's production, ju- just in terms of scoring, this offense is in a world of hurt. Now, maybe Jeremiah would get some of those, and maybe Kalecki would, maybe Giles would, but we really haven't seen that. We, we've seen them get the yardage. I mean, well, we've seen Giles certainly get the yardage, but we haven't even seen, you know, when, when called upon, Jed hasn't gone to him in the red zone. I mean, there's been, been a couple of times he has, but not as much as I thought we would see, and certainly not from Jeremiah. And so that's what's made the emergence of – not emergence, but again – to the rest of the, the country, the not us. Progression, yeah. Well, well, but also for the rest of the country, the emergence of sure. for us, well, it's just the annoying thing we already knew what was coming. But that's what makes it even more impressive because he's doing this knowing going into every game, he's their A receiver. It's not like, oh, hey, maybe it's J- Jeremiah this week. Well, another defense is going to rather have Jeremiah end up being that guy or Giles being that guy versus Denzel, who they know. It's like, Going into the Iowa game, you knew Caleb Johnson was going to be that guy. The one dude who can't beat you is that guy. And yet when Denzel beats them, that's what it's like for the other team. Yeah, and I I certainly see what you're saying there, and that's been a really big part of it. But the biggest biggest thing for me with all of this is – seeing him get this recognition among some of the nation's elite where, you know, we put out a show a couple weeks ago talking about is, is he the best receiver in the big 10? And we saw a lot of pushback from other fa- big 10 fans, rightfully so I get it where, you know, it's a bunch of Ohio state's fans saying Jeremiah Smith, immaculate Buka, all these sort of guys, Ty Fenton at Maryland's been fantastic all season long. Zachariah branch, super duper talented down at USC where there are a lot of those guys that certainly deserve to be in that conversation, but seeing Denzel go from a, a guy who had, what, 70 career yards, something along those lines coming into the season, just explode in this way is so cool to witness because with a kid like that who, you know, underrated three-star prospect, getting getting the chance to sit for a couple of years, learn from Jamarcus Shepard, who you and I both love and had a great relationship with during his time here, where seeing and knowing what Jamarcus was doing with these guys, working with them, doing all that sort of stuff, and then seeing how that grew and how Kevin Cummings was able to pick up the mantle from Jamarcus and keep working with Denzel and keep pushing him forward and seeing Denzel, like, especially because it all started in the spring where in the spring you could see, Oh yeah, this dude is going to be a future one. A and you and I talked about that. We made, made it no secret that that was something that was going to happen. We're not tooting our, horn, our own horns when we're saying this, it was Denzel Boston. And I'm probably quoting both of us from different points in the spring was the best player on the field each and every day. And to say that about a, a guy who's, you know, term, in terms of eligibility, still a sophomore, in terms of somebody who hadn't played a lot of, a lot of college football because of who was ahead of him, to make that jump so easily and so seamlessly, and to, at the same point, look like such a well-rounded player in every aspect of his game in this new conference and doing it against some really, really tough defense defenses is absolutely awesome to see. And not only that, there really hasn't been a learning curve. Now, again, I yeah, as, that's, as, yeah. As, as you as you preface, he's had the past two years to sit. But he, a lot of times, you've seen guys. I mean, look at even some senior guys. That look how it's taken Jeremiah a little bit to break into the system and things like that. This is a new system for all of them. It's not like Denzel was here at, or with Jed at Arizona. And again, the route concepts and a lot of that some some stuff are kind of similar. 
But still, it's it's a brand new system for all of them. And Denzel is basically like, look, like I could have been doing this last year. Could have been doing this probably two years ago. Maybe not at this level. Last year, probably more so than, than the freshman year. But this is kind of like the culmination of anything. And I remember you mentioned it or kind of briefly touched on it where it's like, I think Denzel comes back and it's like, yeah, I would be surprised if he didn't just because if you think about it, no matter what his numbers are at the end of the season, it's still only one season. And yes, right. he's, so got that's- the physical, he's got the physical tools and all that. So he's got to be an NFL guy. But I think yeah. NFL teams are like, well, why would we take you in the first two days? At we this point in like- time. Exactly. Right. So I, I certainly agree with you there, and that's one of the cool things to think about in terms of his his draft stock. Shout out to my buddy Devin Jackson. He put out some stuff uh, last week talking about this a little bit where he was like, yeah, this, at this time next season, we should be talking about Denzel Boston as a first-round wide receiver talent. And I 100% agree with that, and that, that should be where this is going which is really cool where, you know, you think about the history of wide receivers at Washington over the last, not even, you know, just the last two seasons with all the guys that came through here, where you try to, you know, reel it back a little bit more. And I think about, uh, shout out to Cam LSR for posting the Jaden Mickens photos for his uh, name, that dog. I, I love those. Those are super fun. I think about Jaden Mickens. I think about Casey Williams, who's one of my favorites, you know, obviously John Ross, Dante Pettis, those guys as well, where there really has, a, you know, even though we transferred, we know those for very different reasons for Puka, all these sort of guys where Puka's making a name for himself in the NFL. And you think about adding Denzel to that list. And I just think that's really cool to see. And it just continues to add and continues to move forward where, you know, we're going to get to some of the guys that are committed in the 2025 class a little bit where I think about what that next wave of wide receivers can look like at Washington and how Denzel can be the guy that that torchbearer to just say, all right, you know, I, it was my turn to get the torch passed me from Rome. And now I can do the, the same exact thing where there's no drop off where you can look at watching Rome and even with Jalen Polk and Jalen McMillan, and you can say, all right, I'm expecting some sort of drop off here. And yeah, the numbers aren't the same, but you look at what Denzel Boston is doing and you just say, yeah, that, that dude is going to be another elite wide receiver here at Washington. Yeah. And I'm sure you can already kind of see the similarities between him and Rasheed, where you can see the progression going and, yeah. and Andre Harris being the next kind of, and I guess justice, well, we haven't seen justice Williams just because, Jason Robinson as well, because that whole class is super stacked. I I love that whole class of guys. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm saying in terms of the body yeah. types and size. Oh, no, and, I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Keith and J-Rob, J. that kind of position. So I'm just saying from strictly that extra receiver position, not that J-Rob and, and Justice couldn't do that. But when you look at the progression, everything is lining up perfectly for you to just say, hey, well, we can kind of become not – I know Ohio State fans are going to hate this, but you know, why just for you, right? You know, if you're if you're not going to be DVU, if or if you kind sure. of still could be, but you know, it's that similar thing where that last class, that was past draft class, started a potential wave. If Kevin Cummings and Jed Fish can continue that wave, which they have in the 25 class, which we'll get to, you know, in the last segment here, that could be a major building block for this program. When you think right. about what is it going to look like next season, that's again, that's which is why I wanted to touch on Denzel probably coming back because. A, it makes the most sense business-wise, short-term and long-term for him. And also, B, without Giles and Jeremiah, you're looking at Rashid, Audric, Justice, right. Dea, like Chris Lawson. Like the, the list goes on and on. Of like, like wow, that that receiver so, is nice in a hurry. I think we can start that conversation now, though, in terms of the recruiting aspect of it, because I think about some of these guys who've committed elsewhere: the the Donovan Alubades, uh, the Andrew Marshes. Some of these guys who have gone elsewhere where, you know, let's see what happens with Andrew Marsh and how that passing offense looks. I don't know if he's going to stick in Michigan with, with everything that's going on there. And we know what that looked like when he first committed. And if he does decommit, I feel like Washington is going to be in real strong contention where, you know, Donovan, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. That's just his name I'm throwing out with. We know how that recruitment ended up being down the stretch, but all of a sudden you can point to Denzel where this coaching staff, we know he wasn't, you know, he wasn't recruited like originally by this coaching staff, but now that he's here now that uh, they're, that they're here and now that he's having the success with them, with Kevin Cummings, all of a sudden that's a guy Kevin Cummings can point to and say, Hey, look at what I've helped him do. And again, it's not a hundred percent Kevin where, like we said, Jamarcus Shepard deserves some credit there, but now all of a sudden they can plant their flag with Denzel and say, Hey, yeah, you know, because Lars, you and I, when we talked about wide receiver recruiting, we were talking about Jacob Cowan. We were talking about Dorian Singer, Tyro McMillan. We were talking about guys that are not on this team, that have never worn purple and gold. Now we can do that. 
because of, you know, the guys you mentioned, you talk about Rashid and how good he's looked at times where, you know, we, we talk about that flea flicker at ad nauseum. And if, you know, that ball's a little bit more out in front, a whole different conversation. But we know he looked really good in practice in the spring and in the fall. And now Denzel can be this guy for Kevin Cummings and this offensive coaching staff to say, hey, we know wide receivers are looking here. We know that we can be in the race. And now we have a guy to point to to say, do you want to be developed like that guy? Because there you go. Now we can say, all right, we can sell you on being Denzel Boston. Exactly. And that's a, and that's why this year was kind of so imperative where when you look at the recruiting class and Jed trying to sell guys on Washington, it's, hey, well, this is what this is going to look like. We talked about it with the safeties where it's like, hey, look at all these four-star safeties that many of these guys are getting. But they, what does it look like? You know, you can you can show Patriots, you can show this and that, but what does it look like in purple and gold? Now everyone's seen it. It's like, oh, wait, actually, Washington? Yeah. Let me, let me. Hang on, is that offer so good? Like, let me yeah, get it. exactly. So, lots of that being said, let's jump more into the recruiting side of things, which we'll get to right after message from our friends over at Hims. Your sex life is important, but your schedule is busy. You don't have time to go to a doctor's office to get treated for ED through Hims. You can get a personalized ED treatment without stepping foot outside your door. Hims is changing men's health care by providing you with access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. The process is 100% online, so there's no need for uncomfortable doctor's visits and no insurance is needed and one low price covers everything from treatments to ongoing care. All you have to do is answer a series of questions on their site and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option if prescribed your medication ships directly to you in discreet patch packaging for free with hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers. Hims can help you find the ED option that works for you. Start your free online visit today at hims.com slash locked on. That's H I M S.com slash locked on for your personalized ED treatment options. Hims.com slash locked on. The products mentioned are chewable compounded products, which are not approved by or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Prices vary based on product and subscription plan. So Lars, 247 Sports released their updated recruiting rankings where they do, you know, they got a whole bunch of different ones. We personally like using the 247 Sports uh, rankings, not the the composite because, you know, it, it, it compiles like ESPN rankings, which are usually just horrible. Like, let's be real here. So we like the, the 247 Sports rankings a lot. They released an update on Wednesday, which contained five prospects that are committed in Washington's 2025 class among their top 247, and that's Zadris Rainey Sale, Dylan Robinson, Zach Staskowski, Chris Lawson, and Vander Plug. Just right away, which one stands out to you the most for any particular reason? Oh, I mean, the one that you probably talk about the most, so I'm in the mind, but I'll, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the torch and, and run for it for a little bit. It's dangerous because for all the reasons. Oh, really? Oh, I'm, about, I'm kind of shocked here. Okay. I, I thought you could go somewhere else. No, because the more I think about it, what you're losing at the linebacker position and the reason for, like, when we talk about replacing talent and leveling up, Zadrius is the perfect example of that out of position of need where you're talking about losing four guys, both your starters, and there's a couple of guys in that room that will probably pop up a little bit next year. You know, Kamori, more so as an outside guy. But when you look at the rest of that, Devin Bryan, if we look at you know, a couple of guys in that room, it's like somebody needs to take the torch in that room. And I think right. getting Zadrius year one, class one right away. I mean, not year one because this is year one technically. But you, you know what I mean? Class one to build yeah, into yeah. the year two, that sort of thing. Cannot be understated. And, again, that's with respect to all those other. That's not saying that any of those other guys would be bad. Sure. But just – when you look at building out the heart of a defense, especially you know a linebacker, like how could you not have anybody else than Zadrius? So I I certainly agree with all the points you just made. I'm I'm not I when when I was when I say I was shocked that you went with him, it's not because I was like oh he's you know not the most talented player or anything because he absolutely is. He's going to be fantastic. That's why you know we're on this this train of especially if he enrolls early, he practices in the spring, he practices in the fall. If he starts, I'm not going to be surprised. At the very least, he's pulling a demand and playing in every single game. So I I personally, like when I looked at this, it was Zach Staskowski for me, where he's been rising and rising and rising and finally just, boom, exploded, where he's ranked number 164 overall, I believe, where, which makes him the second highest ranked member in this class in terms of the 247 rankings behind Zadrian's. And it's one of those things where I, first of all, because there, there are a couple different ways we can take this. We know his recruitment is not done. He's committed to Washington, but a lot of other schools have come on late. 
since he committed to Washington, he got offers from Georgia, Oregon, and UCLA. Let's take the UCLA one out of, out of this, but he did get that offer, so I needed to say it. He's going to take a visit to Georgia. He's told that to Andrew Nemec. He also told Nemec that he's going to take a visit to Oregon, and th- these are going to be official visits. So he's going to do that before you know he officially signs. I don't even know what's going on with the whole NLI thing and the NCAA. Nothing makes sense with them anymore. Every ba- every decision they make is bad for one reason or another. This one might be one of the worst, so I'm not even going to get into that today. But I look at Zach's recruitment. And the first thing I think of is shout out to this coaching staff because they did a fantastic job identifying him, recruiting him because he was committed to Minnesota and finding a way to get him in the boat. They did that very well. And they did that very, very quickly. That all happened, you know, from the time he got offered to his commitment. What, what was that? Three weeks. That's what it felt like. At least it was, it was very quick to get him in the boat. But the other thing is it's far from over. And this is a guy who, you know, we talked about it the other day. Jed's talked about it. We all know it. We saw it is Washington needs to be big and physical in the trenches. Getting Jack Schaefer, the kid from North Dakota, was a really, really nice add to the offensive line. But all of a sudden, Zach has become the linchpin. He's become the, the staple of this offensive line in this class. You need to do everything you can to keep that kid committed. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, it's like if you do the hard work to get him out of one commitment, you can't, you know, be like, oh, well, you know, it's kind of hard to match. But that's where we talk about the resources, and that's where we talk about the investment. And, again, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record because fans are like, well, why doesn't Jed put more money in or whatever? It's like, look, Jed could put half his salary in. He still needs other people. Like, Jed could right. still put $3.5 million in the Mount Lake Futures or the Go Big Fund or whatever it is. And yet, okay, 3 and a half still ain't twenty. So yeah, how's not even close? So right. it's not it's not like you know, Jet, it's, this is all on Jet, but this is why kind of identifying so many different guys along the offensive line and building out that class the way they did was so imperative to where if you do end up getting a late gem like a Staskowski, knowing you're probably gonna have to be in a four quarter battle for him. I mean, we saw the Col- the Coleman Brewster brothers go down to Oregon last weekend. you this is just what you're asking. You're you're asking to be in the Big Ten. You're asking yeah. for big time fights. We've seen Washington go head to head with a couple other programs for some other commits throughout the, the recruiting, the 25 recruiting class. But this, I think, by far would be the biggest state. So the Adrian's like the most important. South yeah. Cass the biggest statement. That, that, so that's why, you know, to your point about because again, it's kind of surprising because well, I can see the case being made for certainly for either Dylan Robinson or uh, Zach Saskowski. But I think just especially with the Georgia offer, I mean, I love the straight UCLA car right there because, like, <laughs> what, what, you know, why? But, you know, and the Oregon offer, absolutely, much like Washington, is not going to like hear it. But, look, like, the thing with that is, like, well. Because he's a kid from Oregon, too. Yeah. But it's like, if I'm South Africa, why didn't you guys offer earlier? Why did it take yep. me committing to Washington after committing to Minnesota for you guys to identify my talent? You could have still offered me and said, hey, look, don't commit right now. We're still kind of sorting some things out, but we like you. How many coaches in this day and age are doing that? Where it's like, hey, look, like, right. it's not a totally committable offer, but it will be eventually once we sort some things out. But we like you. It's basically like, hey, we identify you. Here is a scholarship. It's basically and to, to, to take that point, you know, a little bit further. Who does that more often than any other school? Who hands out more offers than any other school? Yep, I, I you, you might you might want to be careful there because some yeah. Oregon fan might screenshot that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you knew it as soon as you did it, but. Uh, no, so I, I want to take a minute here just talk about one of the other guys where somebody else who I've seen a lot of fans worrying about what his recruitment might look up like up until signing day that I I still feel really good about. And that's Vander Plute, where, first of all, I want to give a shout out to because we might not get a chance to talk about uh, Dylan Robinson or Chris Lawson this time around. Shout out to both those guys. I'm so excited to see both of them in purple and gold. They're going to be fantastic players. But I want to talk about Vander Plute because, you know, we talked about uh, Quentin Moore with Jed Fish on Monday, where he said, "Yeah, there's a, a chance that he might, uh, you know, find a way to medically redshirt because of what he called a substantial MCL injury, which is a bummer. Like, you know, I, I can't say that either of us surprised in terms of looking at that hit and seeing that. Where, of course, we were holding out hope to and wanting to see Quentin come back, but you know, even under the circumstances that he does end up playing in all the you know the games for the remainder of the season and does graduate." Where no matter what situation we're looking at here, Lars, Washington needs a lot of help at tight end next season. 
we know Charlie Kroll is out for the season. We'd love to see him get healthy and participate, you know, in the spring and in the fall. We'll see what that looks like. Uh, you know, same with Ryan Otten, where Jed announced that he's done for the year. But I look at these two guys that are committed in the 2025, 2025 class. I look at Vander Plug, I look at Baron Aone, and I see a lot of talent. And I see a lot of talent that can play early. And I feel like this is a very similar conversation that we had the last time we discussed Vander Plug. And that's that the early playing time might be the biggest factor in holding on to him. Where I know fans are worried about Oregon. Fans are worried about Alabama, who also offered him. They're worried about Texas A&M. But I look at Vander and I say, I don't think that those schools are going to offer him playing time. And especially when you point to Decker to Graf, just like with Denzel Boston, you can point him and say, look what that kid's doing. You can do the same exact thing here and say, all right, yeah, I'm going to go play early at those two or at any of those other schools as well. And I think that's the biggest thing with Vander, just like it might be with uh, Staskowski. Oh, without question. Yeah. I mean, if there's one position that you could say playing time is a selling point, it's tight end. And so I think I think that's why those guys and also you same thing with Saskowski, where if you're Oregon, why didn't you offer earlier? I mean, Plume right. took took a visit before he came up to Washington before his official visit to Oregon. It was unofficial, but you know, it's still like you sure, yeah. knew it. But, and and they and he actually when I talked to him, he's like, Yeah, they were honestly said so they had some guys higher on the board, and it's like, right, so how do you think a kid's like, eh, they wanted some higher guys and like unless Washington falls into the Pacific Ocean, you know, like why would I go there versus Oregon when I know I'm going to play at Washington? And you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. If Jed leaves, and so be it. But might as well start my career at Washington, right? And I, I, you know, I know I know fans won't like hearing the the last part of that, but I don't even know if that's necessarily what it is. Where it's something where I I think you and I discussed this the other day. We look at what this uh, what this coaching staff did. Where you talked to Jonah Coleman about this a little bit, where it's the that 2022 class that they had down there, where it's okay, yeah, all these guys are coming in after a one and eleven season, but they were bought in and they were saying, all right, we like what Jet has to offer, we like what this is, and we're here to stick this out and here to build this. And it feels like that's what you know, especially if this entire class ends up sticking, and maybe there are one or two more guys that are coming at some point. Which hey, we're gonna. Whenever any of that stuff happens, check out our Lockdown Huskies Insider group because that's where it goes first. Uh, anything like that, any anybody that might be added, they're all bought into what Jed is selling. Because you made this point the other day. It's you look at this this coach this recruiting class, and it's all it all happened in the summer. It's you know even before they pl- they played a game here, it was all right. We like this staff. We like what they're selling. Let's let's do this. Yeah, and I think that then nothing is going to change in that regard. And I think, as Jed said, you know, they're going to give some younger guys a couple of looks, and that could maybe even open some more eyes. And I think, you know, when you look at the back end, there's so many positions. And Jed said it on Monday, you know, we need a big roster influx of talent again, another big one. Yep. And I, this is going to be more so for star high school talent. You got a couple, you know, with Demon, Adam was a three, and all that sort of stuff. But it's like this is going to be the class where Jed twenty two class at Arizona is confirmed. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all the for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support, and thank you so much for making Lockdown Huskies your first listen today. Now for your second listen, check out the Lockdown Big Ten podcast. Craig Sheeman puts the Big Ten first. When everyone else overlooks it, you can find Lockdown Big Ten on YouTube wherever else you listen to your podcast. Speaking of which, once again, if you have any questions you want us to answer on our Friday mailbag, drop them right down below in the comments. You can tweet at us at Lockdown Huskies or at either of our our handles, which are down below, at our Thomas Sharp 34 at Lars Hansen. We're going to answer as many questions as we possibly can. It can be about anything, recruiting, state of the roster, moving forward, our thoughts on the season so far, food, movies, anything like that. I got a shoes question. I can't wait to answer that. There are so many of those we're going to be getting to. And with that being said, if you want to stay tuned for everything we got going on, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Games, Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating the channel with new content every single day. So make sure you click that like button, click that little bell so you never miss when we post new video if you have any questions comments concerns up right down below in the comment section and if you're audio only please leave us five star reviews it does help us out a lot thank you so much for tuning in and we'll talk to you on friday